So uh, Swiss German would be an option for me, uh, English, because German, uh, as you know, the, the Swiss don't speak proper German. My, uh, my uh, six-year-old digital native uh, is telling people rather proud that his dad invented the fastest internet in Switzerland. It's called Fiber 7. I was, um, thank you. When we went to Greece uh, for vacation, I was in a, in a target conflict because I had to explain him why he couldn't watch YouTube. Um, I mean, Greece, you know, it's uh, maybe a bit difficult. But as a matter of fact, here in Hamburg, it's not any better. I'm uh, next door in the hotel uh, uh, intercity, and they offer free Wi-Fi with 256 kilobit. <laughs> if you want 5 meg internet, you pay 8 euro extra per day. So this is where we are in 2015. A uh, few words about me. I married one son, as I said. Um, two, he, he was born 2009, and he was able to unlock the iPhone uh, with the age of 17 months. No one showed him how. <laughs> um, my early connection with digital techniques was about uh, 1978, when I was playing with these chips, uh, 7400. Who knows them? Raise your hand. Few, thanks. Uh, later on, I did an apprenticeship as a Fernmelde and Elektronik Apparate Mondeur, and uh, I started to uh, do IT business about 1991. And uh, 1996, almost 20 years ago, we started with Linux stuff. Uh, my first uh, Linux was SUSE 4.2. Two, in year 2000, we started with INIT7, and uh, later on, I became president of the Swiss Six I Association. This is uh, uh, an association which runs an uh, internet exchange. I had also my time in the startup called Satu, um, did some network architecture, OTT, IP television. Um, and, uh, besides, I need a hobby, so I'm uh, uh, also a politician for the Social Democrats in my city parliament, already eight years. And uh, then I started with the other hobby, Fiber 7, as you know. Oh, besides, uh, I was also uh, working in the uh, Internet Expert Group of the Social Democrats Switzerland, and uh, the Internet um, paper was um, uh, uh, adopted uh, earlier this month by the uh, National um, Delegiertenversammlung. I don't know what this is in English. <coughs> so, buffering sucks. Ladies and gentlemen, this talk is not about Deutsche Telekom, it's not about peering, it's not about interconnection, it's about these thousands and millions of youngsters out there which want to watch YouTube in HD resolution without buffering. So let's, let's quickly look at the reason why YouTube and all the other video buffers. So it's usually it's, it's lack of bandwidth, so you, if you have a 2 meg DSL or you have a, a intercity Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi with 250 kilobits, um, so HD video is not possible. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, they have old P, uh, P, um, PCs, so CPU power is an issue these days, no longer relevant. Uh, Wi-Fi quality sucks sometimes. This is rather an individual issue, and sometimes we have an oversubscription of the shared node, mainly in cable networks. Streaming source can be too far away. If you stream from the US, it uh, doesn't really go well. Um, that's why we have so many CDN content delivery network systems uh, uh, close to the end users. Uh, then adaptive streaming is, uh, it, it can be an, an advantage, but also disadvantage. You cannot turn it off uh, when you watch HD and uh, the connection sucks. You just cannot keep it on HD. It just uh, um, drops to SD or low resolution. It works, yes, um, but um, uh, Claire Underwood in a low res is not so cool. 
Routing algorithm issue, sometimes it's a mismatch of client and server. If, you, if your client is uh, assigned to the wrong CDN server, then it's uh, also slow. Uh, any cost routing is a trick sometimes. And last but not least, and the most important thing, it's oversubscribed into connections. We go back quickly to the old days. The caller pays. When you call your mother-in-law and uh, you talk with her, well, she talks to you for 45 minutes and you say hello and goodbye, uh, you still pay the call. So, with YouTube, it's not any different. You click YouTube, and then YouTube talks to you for hours, maybe, and then you say goodbye, basically. So, is the broadband customer calling the YouTube server, or is it vice versa? Is the YouTube server calling the broadband customer? Probably, the, it's, it's the broadband customer who calls. But still, the data is flowing from the server to the client. But the client is causing the traffic because he is requesting the traffic. And if we look at the structure of the internet, we have uh, basically the uh, pro oh, doesn't work here. Red button is dead. Never mind. Uh, the, we, have, we have the end user to the right. And uh, we have his, the provider network, and the end user is only connected to the provider's network. On the left side, we have all the content in the internet. We have uh, the media and video and streaming and torrent and you name it. But there is always only one way going to the, uh, to the end user. It's the yellow marked interconnection points, and there is no way around them. And this basically means the provider can monopolize the end customer, at least as long as he's connected or subscribed. There is no alternative way. So this gives the provider a, 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 a position of power. On the other hand, these interconnection points used to be, uh, for a long period of time, uh, so-called zero settlement interconnections. And they are basically the foundation of the internet. Without zero settlement peering, without interconnection, the internet wouldn't exist as we know it. The broadband provider uh, mainly the incumbent, the ex-monopolist, or large cable operators, they tend to become more and more restrictive to provide sufficient interconnection capacity. Not upgrading interconnection to the requirements is uh, very common these days, and it's a passive, aggressive behavior. So the many, many uh, providers, um, to name a few, Deutsche Telekom, <clears throat> um, they just do nothing. They just wait. And the end customer are suffering. Buffering is very common, especially during prime time. And uh, this is basically what the topic of, uh, the main topic of this conference is. It's a gated community. The provider creates a gated community for his own end customers. So, as I said before, the data is flowing from the server, from the video server to the end customer. Uh, it's about 50 times more traffic flowing to the client. And uh, the, the usual traffic ratio we, we have uh, for broadband providers is 1 to 5 or 1 to 10. So they're pulling about 10 times more traffic towards the end customer. And uh, then we have this interconnection policy, so they, do, they don't do anything. Uh, as I said before, they uh, just oversubscribe the existing interconnection. And if you want to upgrade, you have to have a, a traffic ratio of about 1 to 1.5 to 1.3. But no video stream service can deliver traffic 
and also maintain the traffic ratio. No content provider can. So they, all they can do is they can pay money to get upgraded. And if they don't pay, data is stuck in, in congestion and the clients are suffering and see the, um, the, the buffering sign. Large broadband providers, such as the incumbents and ca uh, cable providers, they want to get paid twice. They, want, they are able to force the money due to the temporary monopoly, as I explained, and they can ask money from the end customer and on the other hand also from the content. This is called double-sided market. And if they don't pay, the content is not paying, this is what we see. And sometimes, as a side note, the end customer pays but still sees this. <clears throat> but IP, would, IP interconnection would be cheap. The business cost per broadband customer is just a few cents per month. And if the provider would invest this, people would be happy. And on top, content providers are easy to deal for peering or provide cash servers, etc. So please talk to the com our community fellows of uh, Akamai, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Limelight, Netflix. T is not telecom, it's Twitch and so too, and a lot of others. So traffic congestion is costly. I uh, took a random Google search and uh, was looking for how much traffic is actually costing. And uh, Die Welt showed the result. Staus kosten in jedem Haushalt 509 Euro pro Jahr. <clears throat> so my assumption was, if traffic jam is costing money, then probably data traffic jam is also costing some money. But I figured that no one was really exploring that field yet. So I thought I'm going to do a, a, a little Milchbüchli Rechnung. <laughs> so, uh, when, when, when I was a child, the milkman came every, every morning and uh, we, we just put our order into the Milchbüchli and uh, he put the milk into the a box outside of the house, and by the end of the month, uh, we went to the shop and paid our Milchbüchli Rechnung. Hmm. Uh, uh, so, so this is my quick calculation. Uh, we have about 30 million broadband connections in Germany. Uh, I assume that everybody is waiting for uh, one minute accumulated uh, to, while watching uh, Netflix, YouTube, whatever. Probably this is far too less. Who thinks one minute is fine, or who, think, who thinks one minute is not enough? Oh, okay, so let's, let's stick with one minute for the calculation. And uh, I also assume that uh, uh, five euro per hour waiting is, uh, is, is a good, good salary. So uh, if you think uh, five euro is not enough, um, so you can uh, adapt the calculation. This is called Reservationslohn. Uh, I have no clue what it means, but uh, this was on Wikipedia for time. When you take a job or refuse a job, how much would, uh, the, would, would the, be the value for the, for the spare time? So this is my calculation. If you wait one minute per day, this is six hours per year. If you, t uh, calc if you um, multiply this with the five euro, every pro bank customer would be uh, with, uh, with 30, uh, we would pay 30 or loss, lose 30 euro per year. This uh, sums up with uh, uh, 30 million broadband subscribers to 900 million euro per year. This is the economic damage in Germany per year. And <laughs> as we can assume that a large part of the buffering is caused by the insufficient interconnection, especially during prime time when everybody wants to watch Netflix. Uh, this is also a result of the restrictive peering policy of the incumbent and large cable operators. 
um, um, the ability for them to force some extra money out of this uh, double-sided market power, as I explained, they probably would gain a few millions. I don't, I don't have exact figures, but I assume it's uh, probably some 10, 20, 30 millions per year they could, they could uh, uh, force uh, through this uh, market power. Uh, on the other hand, we have the damage of 900 million euro per year, and I mean, this is uh, like, uh, how do you say that? Uh, imbalance. So, my conclusion, in democratic countries like Western Europe, the economic gain of a multi-billion company at the expense of the general public is commonly not tolerated. And the, uh, then, then the next question is basically following my, uh, previ the previous talk of Thomas. When will the regulators wake up and force every market participant to, to cooperative peering and interconnection? Because the end user is suffering. The public is suffering. Zero settlement peering, as I explained, is rather common. Of course, the, uh, um, the, the incumbent, the Deutsche Telekom lobbyists would tell otherwise, but uh, that's, this is clear. Uh, the unbalanced traffic should no longer be used to refuse peering. And uh, also disputes about interconnection should be resolved rather quick. Um, my case against Swisscom is taking, our, uh, is taking years already and still no end and no light at the end of the tunnel. And then, last but not least, we should have uh, broadband providers be, must be committed to the interest uh, of their own end user customer uh, base. Uh, as I said, telecom managed to get paid twice this because of their market power, and other telecoms such as Telecom Hungaria or Swisscom, they use Deutsche Telekom and their market power as a leverage to, re to, to um, uh, force their also restrictive peering policy. And the regulators so far don't do much. I quote here Mark Furer, this is the chief of ComCom Switzerland. Uh, nur ein fauler Regulator ist ein guter Regulator. Thank you. Questions? <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Freddie, and let's have Thomas back up on stage, and we're going to take questions, please. Uh, there is, <clears throat> there's actually more than the mics I said before. There's two right up on the top, and there's three in each aisle. So if you please line up if you have any questions, ask, and please speak into the mic. We need your question on tape, and those who are leaving now, um, do it silently, please. Okay, first question. Wow. Yeah. Over there. I have no. a question for Thomas. Um, from your talk, it, it, it sounds like you did a lot of work. Can you tell us a little bit about the budgeting that goes into have a team like that? Yeah. Um, so, Save the Internet is a collision of 12 NGOs, um, which have all their independent budget. There is no um, fixed budget for the work that uh, we've been doing as a whole. Uh, all of them have transparency reports, um, so I cannot really speak for the budget of, of ADRI or Access. Uh, the organization where I'm based in Austria um, got a grant from the Media Democracy Foundation uh, from 10,000 euros and uh, money from Netflix, uh, 10,000 euro also. And we used both for development and paying for the faxes, because in the second run of the fax tool, um, the provider that I was referring to was no longer paying. Um, otherwise, the funding in general about digital rights in Europe is awfully low. Um, so if you compare it to the US, where you had double-digit millions uh, going into the lobbying, it is ridiculous um, what, what resources we have here in Europe. Um, and we are thinking about making a donation tool for the new safety internet. But again, that's complicated um, because you have 12 NGOs with very different activity scales. Like some of them do a lot, others not so much. So how would you divide the money? These are unresolved questions that we're working on right now. 
If you want to support us with independent funding, then just donate to the individual organizations. Um, EDRI, Initiative for Netzfreiheit, um, are probably the ones I would mention most because they have done most of the work. Access now as well, but they generally have a lot of funding from the US, so I don't think they need it that much. So to summarize, I saw a picture of, of your team. I saw all the work you did. You did that for 20,000 euros? Uh, no, um, I never got a set. I, I, I was paid by Edry for four months when I was working in Brussels with them directly for the first reading, but otherwise this was mostly free time. I got my uh, expenses covered for travel, but other than that, I'm doing this in my spare time. And also now I'm employed. I work for a data protection NGO, so they are allowing me to do a lot of my stuff also for net neutrality. But yeah. We're all elephants, we do it for peanuts. Okay, yeah. number one, go ahead. Yeah, hello. Uh, hi, Thomas. Thanks a lot for your work. Um, uh, gr uh, that's great. Um, I have a question about the involvement of the business, the angels, and the companies. Uh, what is the reason, what do you think, why they? came so late into this discussion in Germany and what probably can we do to change this in the future because I think that's a, a, they are great allies in, in this fight. Yeah, that's, you're asking exactly the right question. Um, sadly, in Europe, you have no organized um, voice for startups or for SMEs when it comes to digital rights issues. Um, and you would have to work with them to get them involved in the debate. They were really late to the party and then again mostly activated through US networks. Um, so the connection between the civil rights scene here and the business scene, particularly the one which is organized in Brussels with European umbrellas is very weak. Uh, so everything you can do there to strengthen this connection would be great. Um, but I don't have those business contacts. I, I got a few people involved in the first reading stuff, but we would definitely need more people that act as multipliers to get more companies involved. Particularly now, when we enter into a new phase with the Barrett guidelines, we no longer lead the loud arguments of, um, of, 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 of many people. We need more the, the arguments from the business side, from the universities, from those people who run networks. These arguments are better suited to make a difference with the regulators. Mm -hmm. because and, and, and to add, it, add uh, don't underestimate the influence of the lobbyists of the big names. I mean, the telecoms and the Liberty Globals, they have a lot of money and they try to influence the politicians as good as they can. They, 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 don't, they do a good job from their perspective. You can be sure that uh, the telecoms will have people for all 28 regulators now continuously lobbying for an upcoming course, nine months. Indeed. The question is who is in our team? Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Is there a question from the internet yes. while we're at it? Yes, there's a question. It is um, whether peering providers should differentiate between virtual private network traffic and public traffic. And is the, uh, where is the line between internal, internal network and the public internet? <sighs> what should I say? This is a difficult question. I mean, basically, uh, if you overcommit your backbone, then there is always plenty of, of traffic or plenty of capacity. So there, is, there shouldn't be any differentiation. It's just networks should provide enough capacity and then we're good. A common, a common, uh, uh, a common argument from the big names. Oh, we are investing millions and millions and millions in uh, broadband expansion. But unfortunately, they stop investing right at the end of their own backbone. So they don't invest any money and that would be only a little percentage of the whole of the total investment for the interconnections. Okay, <clears throat> there is another question at number one. Yeah, uh, I have a question about buffering. <laughs> so the most of the content in the web is delivered over TCP IP and uh, will changing the media to something like UDP which has lower overhead over TCP IP, will that change 
the situation? Uh, not really. No. Not really? No. It won't help. I mean, uh, packet loss is packet loss regardless whether it's TCP or it's uh, UDP. You answered my question then. Okay, well, that was a short answer. Uh, <laughs> next question, please. Please talk into the mic. So when I came here this year, I had the impression that at Digital Subscriber Line connections, uh, not only the bandwidth is bad, but also the um, ping gets up way high. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, at home I have Fiber 7 nowadays, so I just thought I got spoiled by fiber connections. But uh, I noticed that ping times went up from, well, from a couple of years ago, 60 to 80 milliseconds from uh, sites in your neighborhood, more or less, um, to nowadays 80 to 160 milliseconds. So where's the problem there? Well, the, the latency is directly related. Uh, if the provider is not delivering enough bandwidth, then ping, ping goes up. That's, that's a normal behavior of, of, um, of TCP. So the problem is also uh, at the interconnection sites? Probably, yeah. Thank Most you. likely. You can find out if you, if you do trace route. Um, then you see where, well, there, there is a, a, long, a long presentation how to interpret trace route properly. Uh, uh, if, you, if you look for a NANOC trace route, you should find this lecture. Uh, uh, but that would probably give some indication. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, next question from the internet, just in between, and then we'll go back. Go ahead. Is Netflix a gated community by itself? And are you sure that their interests will align with the movement of net neutrality in the long run? Um, we should differentiate between Netflix content and Netflix interconnections. Mm -hmm. So for the content, I probably would say yes, but I'm not, I'm not the expert. This would be then layer seven in the OSI model. I'm talking here on layer three. This is content agnostic. Um, Netflix, is they are one of the good guys because they really help to deliver the packets. And uh, I know them personally, a few, a few uh, uh, fellows from the, uh, from the peering community. Uh, they are the good guys, definitely. Um, just also to ask the, this question for the European debate. Um, Netflix was one of the good guys in the US, and they also supported, of course, the, the European movement. But again, they are so big that I wouldn't really trust them as an ally, um, because they could also pay, they could also survive in a double-sided market. And um, for them, in the growing emerging markets like Europe, where they just have started, it's probably risky to allow for this new type of anti-net neutrality mm -hmm. business models. Um, but um, in the consumer side, when net neutrality is seen as an end user issue, I think so far the, the interests mostly align on, on interconnection. They have their own interests, of course. Yeah. So I can say Netflix is definitely paying Deutsche Telekom. Otherwise, no single Deutsche Telekom user would be able to watch any movie on Netflix. So. Okay. For sure. We're short for time, so please, last two questions. One, number two first. Keep it short, please. Talk into the mic. Uh, regarding your first talk, uh, what is the, do you have an explanation for the behavior of the European Commission in behavior of the uh, net neutrality debate? I th especially think of the behavior of Günther Oettinger, who uh, repeatedly said his ridiculously, ridiculously, ridiculously lie of and net neutrality kills, and he repeated it again and again, even if it was, uh, even if there was no reason behind it. And do you have an explanation for this behavior of the Commission mm -hmm. and Juncker and this? Um, for that argument, we had this great YouTube video, "Net Neutrality Kills." If you search, you will find it, or "Net Neutrality Tötet" in German. Um, that de deconstructs this argument of Ettinger. But in general, and you can go back to the previous Commissioner Nili Cruz that I showed, um, our strong suspicion is that the deal was that uh, the telecom industry has to give up a little bit of their profits when it comes to roaming, but on the other side, they gain a lot of future profits on the abolishment of net neutrality. And so it was like, okay, we need a populist argument. Nili Cruz also needs a quick win at the end of her career. Um, and 
this was again like you take a little bit there and put it there for the telecoms industry. And Oettinger is a big industrial favor guy. He is always for big business. Okay, short for time, last question, number one. Okay. Hi, um, so what strategy should an ISP use when their capacity on their backbone is fully loaded? Like first in, first out, or what is your idea about that? <laughs> because the capacity is limited, so when there's so much traffic that everything is stuck. Upgrade. What? Yeah, <laughs> invest in the network. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, sorry, a, a 10 gig port is now some 3,000 euro, including optic and cross connect. Okay. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not that, that much. Upgrade. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's have a hand.